Pump. Mind Pump time. All right. Uh, you ready for the giveaway? I know you are. That's why you're here. Also to listen to this awesome Pat podcast. I know that's the real reason why you're here. Anyway, here's what we're giving away today. You get free access to MAPS Split. It's one of our most advanced bodybuilding workout programs. If you win by doing the following, leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Make it a good comment. And if we pick your comment, we'll notify you and you'll win free access to MAPS Split. Split. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. You got to do all of those things. Finally, we are running a sale this month on two very popular workout programs, Maps Hit and the No BS Six Pack Formula, both 50% off. Go check them out or just go sign up at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code July Special with no space for the discount. All right, here comes the show. One of the number one questions that I get, and it's Probably more common um, from young men, although I do get uh, young women uh, and uh, older men and women that do this, but it's more common with like young college men. I get this question on, I want to get jacked. I want to get shredded. I want to look this way, but I don't, I'm on a college budget yeah. or I don't have a job or I don't have a lot of money. And there's this assumption that you need to have this really expensive, high quality food in order to get an incredible Plus shape. Plus a million supplements to go with it. Right, and honestly, that's such a good point that I, I think the mistake that at least what I made when I was that young kid who thought that same exact way, I was spending two, $300 on supplements a month rather right. than probably missing my protein intake because I wasn't dialing my diet in. Totally, mm -hmm. <laughs> totally. And you know, uh, a big thing with this is for a long time, actually up until recently, I did not understand just how much people wanted to know this information until we did we did one of our long Q&A episodes. And what we do now on YouTube for people listening on podcast is we'll, we'll post the whole episode and then we break up the questions as separate clips. And over the last week, we, you know, we were just happened to be hanging out in the studio looking at, you know, performance of, you know, which questions are people most interested in, which helps us address the, pro the things that people really want to know the most. And one of the questions was similar to this, and that particular clip far eclipsed all the other ones in terms of views and questions and comments. And so we were left saying, you know what, we need to address this because a lot of people have this question mm -hmm. because there's a huge belief and it's largely a myth that eating healthy or eating to get lean or eating to look good is somehow so much more expensive than eating garbage, you know, junk food. So it's like, oh my gosh, I want to do that. But how am I going to do that when I only have X amount of dollars to invest in food every single month? Yeah. And I get where it, it comes from, but the truth is when you really break it down, it's not true. It's actually not more expensive to eat in a way to get your body to look lean and look good and muscular. You just have to know uh, how to do it. Well, is it is it completely not true or is it like, because where I understand and I get it is uh, you could get a lot of calories from the 99 cent menu at McDonald's. So, uh, you know, that I think that's where this stems from is that I know that I can go to Jack in the Box and get six tacos and spend less than $5. Yeah, well, well that's just it. If you're comparing... Health, quote unquote healthy processed food to quote unquote unhealthy processed food? Yes. Right. Like if you go to the store and you're like, I'm going to get, you know, super healthy tacos, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's going to be much more than the Taco Bell tacos. But when you look at buying things, and we'll get into this right in the episode, buying certain foods in bulk, understanding good sources of protein, carbohydrates, and fats, and then you do the per serving uh, value or the cost, you find that it's actually very inexpensive. So yes, if you want to compare healthy, I don't know, fast food to unhealthy fast food, yes, you're you're probably going to save money eating the garbage. I think that's where well, that comes from. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I also think that uh, a lot of people will like look, look at something like Whole Foods where they've actually found and cornered the market in terms of their version of high quality means they just charge more money. Uh, you know, for a lot of these like food items, because yes, if it's labeled organic or it's labeled natural or have, they have all these like marketing terms attached to it, you know, they can charge like premiums for certain things, but you know, there's, there's a lot of other, um, you know, stores and other options out there where it's pretty reasonable. You just have to know where to look. Yeah. And you know, I think first we need to talk about what it takes to get lean 
and what it takes diet wise to you know build muscle and look a particular way. So let's define that first, right? Yeah. Before we get into the foods and how to save money. Now, number one, obviously, if you want to get lean, you have to eat in a calorie deficit. This is just a fact. So I don't care if you like to eat keto or vegan or carnivore or count your macros. Doesn't matter. One rule you have to follow is you have to eat less calories than your body burns. This way, your body can burn body fat for energy. So that's uh, you know that's number one. And then number two, although there's a variance here with how people respond to this, generally speaking, a diet that's relatively high in protein is beneficial for muscle uh, fat loss. And when I say satiety, I mean you know be able to kind of feel fuller on less calories. Now, when I say relatively high protein, I'm not referring to, you know, bro science high protein, which says that you need to eat, you know, one and a half grams per pound of body weight or something like that. I mean about 0.6 to one gram of protein per pound of body weight in relatively lean individuals. So if you're obese, you want to use your lean body mass. But if you're, you know, in this body fat range where you're not obese, uh, you could use your body weight. So if you weigh 150 pounds, you want to aim for anywhere between 100 to 150 grams of protein, essentially, right? That's Those two things are probably are the most important, I would say, in that. In well, that this is also assuming that this conversation is going to appeal to people that are wanting to get shredded. I would think that the, this debate is, is coming more from somebody who wants to get big, right? Somebody who wants to add or well, Because they're eating more food, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's, you're, I don't think it's as expensive to get shredded. Like, or at least when I, at least the, the young man that yeah, I was when I was in my early teens mm -hmm. or, in, or early 20s and, and late teens, um, I wanted to build muscle. I wanted to build muscle and get bigger. And that seemed expensive because it, it meant I had to eat in a caloric surplus and it mean I need to get enough protein and protein seemed to be expensive. If I went to these expensive places or did exactly like you said, I compared, you know, cheap, cheap, Jack in the box tacos to healthier version tacos. Yep. If I did things like that, then it just looked so out of reach, but I also didn't have a Costco membership back then. I I don't think I had ever bought you know twenty to forty chicken thighs and a, a five pound bag of rice or a bag of potatoes right uh, for myself at that time in my life, and so I just assumed that it was yeah. so out of reach. And I'm glad you said that too. So I, what I said about getting lean reverse for gaining, you have to eat in a calorie surplus. So those are kind of the rules, and then we can't miss the exercise component. Good, effective, appropriate exercise programming, which refers to like how the workout looks and the structure of the workout, makes a huge difference. If you eat very well, but your workout programming sucks, you're not going to build nearly as much strength muscle. You're not going to nearly affect your metabolism as positively as you could. It'll be harder to get lean. So good exercise programming is a very important component. I want to I want to elaborate on that a little bit because you and I had just happened to have a really good conversation off air this morning when you were working out and we were sharing kind of what we are currently doing ourselves. And uh, I'd like to think that uh, my programming doesn't suck, but just so the, the listener, the audience knows that sometimes even my programming sucks. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't necessarily mean I'm, I'm like people think sucks. And they go, oh, bad exercises, terrible technique. Knows nothing about resistance training. Knows nothing about resistance training. or yeah. No, what bad programming could look like is this, is what was happening with me was I was in this rhythm. I'm training five, six, maybe even seven days a week, some, seven days a week sometimes in this past like couple months. And I noticed that I wasn't really moving much or my body changing is what I mean by my body composition wasn't changing much yet. I was being very consistent. I was making good food choices. Um, then all of a sudden I had this thing. I think Max went through a regression. I, we got busy and then I uh, naturally fell back to about two or three days a week for a couple of weeks. And what I noticed was my body responded. I actually ended up building a little bit, even leaning. I looked better after those two weeks of less volume. Now, unpacking all that and trying to figure out, okay, well, what happened right there? It's very obvious to me because I know my own tendencies. I have a tendency to under-consume protein intake and under-consume calories sometimes because I'm getting so busy. So I was training too high of volume and intensity for the amount of nutrition that I was giving, mm -hmm. simply backing off the training for the amount of calories and nutrition that I was providing my body, my body thanked me and it responded. Mm -hmm. So I want to be clear that 
bad programming because a lot of people think, oh, I I, I bought Map Santa Ball, I Matt, I bought a mind pump program, or well, I have a trainer who's teaching me who's really smart, or I am a trainer myself, and so I can't have bad programming. It means bad programming for the goal and what you're what's going on nutritionally. So even somebody as experienced as one of us in this room can f fall prey to this thinking that, oh, I'm doing good programming because I'm choosing good exercises mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm lifting well. well with we're good also technique. creatures of habit. Yeah, that you know, too. At the end of the day too, even if you do know what you're doing, uh, it, inevitably you're going to fall into certain patterns because, you know, it's, it's comfortable or it's something that, you know, you've always kind of gone towards uh, to, to try and like recreate this version of yourself that you may have seen, you know, somewhere a, a while back. Uh, but, uh, you know, to be able to kind of seek out something that your body actually will, um, you know, get a new stimulation from and, and respond differently towards, uh, that requires a, a bit of work to kind of go outside of your comfort. Well, the reason why I wanted to bring this point up was because this was also one of the main things that kept me from building and gaining when I was younger was first the argument that it's so expensive. Well, part of the reason why it was so expensive was I was a seven day a week training wakeboarding, snowboarding, basketball playing kid uh, and yeah. run like 5,000 calories. Yes. Day, yeah. I was, I was asking, I was burning so much. And then I'm also telling myself, Oh, I want to build. And so, and so then I'm burning even more calories by training seven days a week. So the amount of calories that I need to consume, just simply backing off the activity, cutting back on the amount of basketball is playing or reducing the amount of snowboarding or wakeboarding or reducing the seven day a week split training routine that I was doing at one point and cutting back to two to three day a week kind of program made it a lot easier and a, a lot less expensive for me to get the amount of calories that I needed in order to build muscle. Yeah. And I want to be very clear. Adam isn't necessarily making the case that you need to train in the way that he said. The case that he's trying to make is the right dose is what's going to get you there. Mm -hmm. And that's very individual. And this is true for nutrition as well. What may be a perfect surplus for muscle building for one person may be just maintenance or a deficit for someone else. Or it may be too much of a surplus for someone else where they gain lots of body fat. This can be true for deficits as well. The right dose for diet and the right dose for exercise, in other words, appropriate for your body and your goals, is going to get you there the fastest. And anything more than that gets you there slower. Anything less than that also gets you there slower. But I like to emphasize the more than that because here's the trap that I fall into. I will hit that right dose. I'll be on all cylinders. Everything seems to be dialed in. Oh my gosh, my body's responding. And I get so excited. You throttle down more. Inevitably, I'm yep. like, well, I can, I can make this happen faster. I can do more. I can handle more. Or maybe if I feed myself more... And then, you know, a few weeks later, I'm in the same situation Adam is in, mm -hmm. where I'm looking back and going, oh, man, I was, I, I, I was rushing something and I was already doing everything right. So very important point that the right dose, the right dose is what's going to get you there uh, the fastest. So, you know, back to nutrition, you got to have adequate calories, meaning the calories have to match your goal and your body. Protein intake, generally speaking, for most people, has to be relatively high. It's just it seems to work best for most people. There's always individual variants. There are some people that a high protein diet can negatively reflect, you know, reflect on digestion and whatnot. But for most people, a high protein diet works best. Fat, you need to consume at least enough fat to meet your essential needs because there's fatty acids that our body can't make on its own. And if you don't consume essential amounts of fat then it doesn't matter what you're doing, your body is lacking what it needs and you can actually cause yourself lots of problems. And then carbohydrates are quite flexible. Some people do much better on higher carbohydrates within their calories. Other people do a lot better with lower carbohydrates within their calorie goals. That's the one where I give people lots of flexibility because carbohydrates are not essential. In other words, you could never eat a carb for the rest of your life and you won't miss anything that's essential. It doesn't mean it's optimal. It just means you're not lacking an essential nutrient that's going to end up hurting your body. But this, again, can vary. But I will say this. Generally speaking, for building muscle, higher carbohydrates uh, as a percentage of your calories tends to work better. And for getting leaner, generally speaking, again, there's, there's lots of variants here, but generally speaking, lower carbohydrates tends to work better 
for getting leaner from most well, people. Well, part of why I think that the, uh, I mean, we know that the carbohydrates lends itself for more energy and performance in the gym. Yeah. So I think that has a lot to do with why it, it, it lends itself well to building. for building. But I also think it, it lends itself well to building uh, on a budget because you, carbs can be cheap. Getting uh, p baked potatoes and rice is- Inexpensive. Very inexpensive. Yeah. Uh, fat sometimes is a little bit more expensive. Protein to, for sure can be. Yeah, and, and protein for sure is more expensive. So it's a great, and, and you ordered that. By the way, you just, Sal just listed those in the the order of operation, right? As far as like number one, priority calories. Yeah. Second one is protein. Third is essential fats. And then fourth would be carbs. So yeah. if I were to order, you know, what what is most important if I'm trying to build, it would be getting my calorie intake because you could eat all the right protein, but if you're un under 500 calories, you're in a it's deficit and you're trying needle. to build, yeah. you're going to have a hell of a time building that way. Totally. So and, and carbohydrates also have a bit of a protein sparing effect. So for some people, and they've shown this in studies, that lower protein but higher carbohydrates, so long as calories are appropriate, does very well. Uh, so the carbohydrates, in other words, and the reason why it's a bit protein sparing is if your calories are low and carbohydrates are low and protein is high, your body can actually take proteins and convert them into the type of energy that you would normally get from uh, carbohydrates. Now, uh, I do want to touch again on the, the fact that eating healthy is more expensive as a myth. This is largely due to the fact that people compare processed or fast foods uh, in this category. And so they say, oh, if I eat at that healthy restaurant versus that unhealthy restaurant, boy, is that more expensive. Or here's that restaurant that serves that high quality steak versus, you know, Chili's or, you know, Outback that serves steak, but that's less, you know, that's not as good quality. Mm -hmm. Wow. Look at the price difference, right? Don't look at processed foods. Don't look at restaurants. Don't look at boxed, you know, package type foods or fast foods. That if you make that your gauge, definitely. And and mainly it's this. This is the reason why. Number one, there's a huge, huge market for fast, cheap, palatable food. Because there's such a large market, there's a, a much, much more production around it. And number two, because people who want to eat out but also really prioritize their health, they tend to be more willing to spend more money and it's a smaller market. But when you look at food that you could buy and prepare very quickly on your own, you'll see that that cost disparity actually becomes, uh, uh, there's no more disparity. I want to make a point about processed foods too, because this was a big mistake that I made uh, in my early years of training. Um, I definitely am guilty of the uh, frozen burritos, hot pockets, uh, you know, ra canned ravioli. <laughs> like, Dude, that was all my food. That right. I, I know I'm listing game. things. I know you guys can relate here, right? And, uh, and those are cheaper foods, right? What you'll find, though, in process, heavily processed foods, uh, protein is one of the most expensive nutrients to put in any food, processed or found whole. And so what you'll see is they get they give you more calories, but a lot of them don't give you that much more protein. Like I eat this, I can eat four of those frozen burritos, but then I still only get like, 30 grams of protein yeah. in there where if, and if I were to break down exactly what each one of those burritos, and then I would just go out and get a piece of chicken or a piece of steak, I'd actually probably get more protein in it. Yep. And since protein is one of the hardest things for someone trying to build to get enough of on a budget, that's the stuff you got to watch for. So a lot of times as a, as a young kid who's trying to build and, and eat on a budget, I would make these choices towards foods like that because the calories were high and the, and the, price was low, mm -hmm. but then I still would miss my protein intake because of that. Oh, I would do the same thing. I would look at, you know, a can of, you know, processed garbage and I would look at the protein be like, wow, if I eat this family of five serving to myself, <laughs> I'll get at least 40 grams of protein. Of course, I'm eating also 2,500 calories and it's like tons of carbohydrates and other stuff. I would do the exact same thing. Yep. But really, if you break it down, and it's a trick, it's a trick you play on your mind. And again, it's a big widely believed myth. If you really break it down, as we're going to do for you in this episode, you'll find uh, you can you can save money. This mm -hmm. is the thing, too. If you do this right, you actually will spend less money yeah. on your food and get excellent phenomenal results. In fact, the foods that we're going to talk about today uh, that are are high, that provide everything that we're talking about and save you money are the not just great foods on a budget. They're the best foods, period, mm -hmm. that you can eat to accomplish uh, some of your goals. So one more thing I want to do, by the way, is I want to touch on uh, organic. I want to touch on grass-fed, pasture-raised, humanely-raised, uh, 
you know, those kind of those those buzzwords that definitely have some meaning, but I do think that we've placed them too high on the hierarchy of priorities for health. healthy food. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, organic doesn't have some potential value for health. Yes, I mean, we can make some arguments. Is it more important than eating the right amount of calories and the right macros? No, it's not. In fact, this is quite true. Even if you look at foods that we know have inflammatory damaging effects in the body, like processed sugars or uh, fat, fats that are inflammatory, right? If you're in a calorie deficit, they're still not good for you. But boy, does that negative effect get blunted significantly. In fact, there's been lots of situations. There's been people who've done this on YouTube, professors, nutritionists, in studies where I remember one in particular where this professor was trying to make a point, and he said, I'm going to eat nothing but Big Macs and Twinkies, I think it was, mm. and I'm going to improve my cholesterol. I'm going to improve my triglycerides and my blood pressure. And he did. And what he did was he just ate low calories. Yeah. He ate garbage food. Now, I'm not recommending this, mm-hmm. but the point I'm trying to make is there's a hierarchy, organic, pasture-raised, grass-fed, you know, all, you know, cage free, like all these things that have some value, and, and all things are not by, as important. All things, by the way, that we promote. Yes, I yes. mean, in, in a perfect world, that's. I mean, that's how I eat, right? But I'm also in a very different position at almost 40 years old than I was at 19 years old. Correct. Right? You can get away with a bit more, I think, too. And and again, cost is one of the biggest priorities when you're in that sort of situation where you're a college student and you know you're on a budget. Yep. Uh, you know, but one thing to also consider is, is, you know, how you assimilate your food and how digestible it is. Oh, that's important. And, you know, if you have any sort of uh, inflammation as a result of, uh, you know, processed foods or things like that, that you're incorporating. So, you know, it, and the thing about the whole organic, uh, you know, types of foods is that there's even places like Walmart that offer organic foods and it's everywhere. So it's not like it's super unaccessible, unattainable to even like seek that oh, out. Dude, you're, you're so right. I, it wasn't that long ago. Obviously, I've been in, in this industry for a long time. It wasn't that long ago that it, I had I had to go specifically to Whole Foods to find organic uh, foods. Well, and now you have direct to consumer brands like yes. Butcher Box. That's, and if yep. you go even more convenient, if you go, which pa- will actually save you money. That's over what I'm conventional- saying. If you go pound for pound, uh, what you're getting as far as protein in a box from Butcher Box and do the math on it, you'll save money in comparison to, and and that's eating grass fed and organic yep. versus going somewhere and, and buying processed food all the time or you know buying it like Safeway the other yep. brands. So. But I do want to make this point that even with us, these are things that we promote. It, we don't promote these above calories, macros, uh, you know that kind of those. Right. There's a hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, like if I'm not hitting my calories and my macros, and I'm not hitting those big rocks, I mean, it really doesn't make sense to prioritize. It's like it's like buying organic gummy worms. Like, oh yeah, I'm gonna be healthy. I'm gonna <laughs> eat these organic gummy worms, or I'm gonna eat these, you know, this 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 potato chips that are grown a particular way and they're healthier. That's you're you're kind of missing the point. So it's important. Because marketing has made those things, although there is value in them, they've made them appear to be more important than the things that are actually the yeah, most so important. True. So let's talk about the hierarchy, right? So most important, number one, calories, proteins, fats, uh, carbohydrates, uh, especially proteins and fats because they're essential. That's the most important thing uh, up there. And carbohydrates are, are, are pretty close. The next thing I would say, and you mentioned it, is digestibility. Mm-hmm. How well does this food digest in your body? Poor digestion, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, or other digestive-related issues, forget the fact that you're eating the healthiest foods in the world. That causes inflammation. That causes damage. That can cause lots of problems, and it really doesn't matter what well, you're and eating an at that exa- point. And a good example of that is that you know dairy products are something that you can get relatively cheap. You can get milk and cheese and products like that for a, a pretty good price, mm-hmm. and that's a good source of proteins and fats. And if that bothers you and upsets your stomach, just because it is on the cheaper side, it is not. So it now that now takes precedent over your oh, the ability to digest it and then to assimilate it becomes more important. That's me. I like dairy. If you have no t- intolerance to it and you digest it very well, is literally one of the healthiest, most nutrient dense foods that you can find on the planet. If you can't digest it, it's poison. Like if I had a lot of dairy it would cause severe health effects on me over a short period of time. Like initially, I'd have terrible digestive issues. Over time, I'd have terrible inflammation, probably cause myself some big uh, problems. So 
What a good point. Another thing I want to touch on when it comes to investing in food, and I don't want to spend too much time on this point because I think sometimes people push this point in order to encourage people to just spend more money on food, but I, I do like this and I think it's, uh, it's definitely valid. The money that you may invest and time that you may invest in your health actually saves you money over time. And it saves you money because of improved productivity. It's just like exercise. Like, oh, I spend an hour a day exercising. I could be doing all these other things with that hour. Studies show that when people take an hour away for exercise, they're more productive at work. they more innovative. So in reality, it's like you're turning in an hour and getting two or three hours of productivity back, right? So eating healthy will do this as well. Look at your healthcare costs. The vast majority of the money that we spend on saving ourselves from dying happens towards the last 10, 20 years of our life. And let me tell you, it's expensive, right? Eating a little healthier uh, and investing in that over time will save you tremendous amounts of money uh, over, you know, over the distance. So it's an important point. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but it's definitely an important point. Now, down that list at the bottom, there's some value, but this is the bottom, is quality. Pasture-raised, organic, that kind of stuff. So if you've hit those other things yeah. and you're, you've got money to spare and you're like, man, I want to really go an extra mile, then I'd say focus on those things. But if you don't have those other things, stop wasting your time and money on, on and organic pasture. that still pastures. is you know, one step above like going into the supplement. Right? I was just going to yes. say, what I was going to say was that notice that supplements didn't even make the list. Exactly. Right? So it's not even on our list of things that you need to do in order for you to get in the best shape of your life on a budget. So uh, that supplements are one of the most grossly overrated things. And again, this is also something else. Just because we talk about organic and grass-fed and the benefit, just because we talk about the benefits of supplementation does not mean that we would put it above this order here. So no. I, I want to make that clear because I know there's people that are like, wait a second, haven't you guys talked about the benefits of this? And the but Yeah, there are benefits. Just like there's benefits to grass-fed and organic, there are benefits to supplementation. But when you look at it like a pie chart, and what, what sliver of that pie is taken up by supplementation or by organic and grass-fed, mm -hmm. boy, is it a tiny Very little sliver in comparison mm -hmm. to everything else you just it mentioned. It is. And by the way, the reason why we think um, those things are so important is because the vast majority of marketing- yeah. So it gets the most money to, to, to market it to you. Yeah. You're not going to see marketing that says, uh, you know, eat, you know, uh, ground beef, buy it in bulk or, you know, mm -hmm. rice, what a great source of carbohydrate. You're not going to see that, right? What you're going to see is eat our ground beef. It's all these other things. Uh, or take our supplements that are proprietary that nobody could copy. This is what's going to take you to the next level. Since you went to supplements, I want to bring this up because I wasn't planning on going here, but I, uh, you just reminded me of something that happens a lot to me when uh, like my sister just recently got on her kick of working out and her husband. And one of the like top things I always get is – they right away want me to recommend what protein powder to give them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's this idea that eating a protein powder or having a protein shake a day is healthy for you or good for you. The only time that I see value in that is if and only if you can't get that through Whole Foods. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I want to make that clear because I, I I think for me, and that's just my my trainer brain, I think that's an obvious statement, but it's not because of the way it's been marketed. Mm -hmm. It's been marketed to you that it's part of getting in shape or part of getting ripped or look at all these buff guys and they always promote protein shakes. Listen, if you can get all of your calories and all of your protein through chicken breasts and beef and Whole Foods, mm -hmm. there's no reason to do a protein shake. No, and, and uh, here's the value value of protein shakes 100% is convenience right. and shelf life. That's it. Uh, it's got a long shelf life. By the way, protein powders are great for your emergency home kits or whatever. So like if you have like your earthquake box or, you know, hurricane, you know, survival kit, protein powder is great because it lasts a long time, super convenient, but that's it. Is it better than eating protein at Whole Foods? It's, no, it's not. It's also relatively inexpensive for what you're getting protein wise. Sure. Because mm -hmm. that's the thing you got to think about. And by the way, too, when again, talking about supplements and protein powders, I get this a lot of times, like, I tell a client or somebody, hey, go get this protein powder. And then they come back and they show me, oh, I went and got this one because it was half the price. Mm -hmm. When you when you when you're shopping for protein powders, it, you're really paying for the protein and the quality of the protein. So if you if you think that your protein powder is so cheap in comparison to the other one that someone's that recommended to you, yeah. you got to learn to flip it around. 
one, read the serving um, amount inside it. That's the first thing you read. And then second, how much protein you get per serving. And then third, mm -hmm. like, is it something that is actually tested and made sure that's all in there or it, by a third Dude, party? buyer beware. Right. There was, I don't know how many times they've gone in independently and studied supplement companies' supplements randomly. Yeah. And it's frightening what they find very rarely is what you're looking for actually oh, in the product. oh dude it's crazy there was that one i don't remember when this happened it wasn't that long ago where there was a popular protein company powder company i can't remember who the company it was, was garden are you talking about that one no that was what that one with um, the metals heavy metals yeah that were like toxic levels of heavy metals in their protein powders so that was one then there was another one where a protein powder was amino spiking, oh, amino yeah. acid spiking. Super popular. Their protein. What they do is when you go in to test protein, a very inexpensive way to test how many potential grams of protein there are per serving, is to test for specific amino acids. So if there's this much leucine, for example, then we can estimate that there's this many grams of protein. Well, what this company did is they put less protein and then just added the amino acid. So it was incomplete protein. Yeah. And they got in big trouble for it uh, You know, by consumers that stopped buying their products. It happens... A lot. So. Well, yeah, you're you're comparing to a study to one one protein powder. That this happens all the time. Oh, yeah. It was a very popular thing when people hacked into this and figured this out. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. All well, right. So let's get into the foods that you can buy that'll save you money that meet all these requirements. Yeah, I just want to say one more thing. Like when I was bringing up all the like I had a nutrition talk with this team I'm trying to help and. Um, you know, that was what, always the first question was, okay, well, what protein powder? Yes. Am, yeah. <laughs> That's why I, I wanted to bring that coach? up. Coach, yeah. And so, I mean, it's a very common thought is if I'm getting back into, you know, like really focusing on fitness and, and focusing on muscle building, like that's the first thought on everybody's uh, brain. And so, again, to what we're going to get into in terms of foods is immediately where I went because – um, there wasn't quite as big a response from kids coming up to kind of ask me versus the parents are really like, well, what do I actually feed them? Yeah. What do I feed them for dinner? What do I feed them for lunch? Like, so, you know, it, these options, like you're going to mention like ground beef and uh, where you can get a lot of protein at a, you know, reasonably priced, uh, you know, you don't have to get steak every night is sort of the yeah. point that I was trying to make. Yeah. There's, so also a little, there's also a little bit of a cycle or a feedback loop that happens with this too. Cause I know there's somebody who's also listening. It's like, I don't know. Every time I do this, that and I start eating my protein shake, I do build muscle or I look better. And that's because a lot of people grossly under consume protein. Yeah, they're hitting yes. their protein target. Right. So now all of a sudden you're starting to hit it or get closer to it. And so you see results from it. So, uh, so they can be, I'm not saying they're not effective. They can be, if you're somebody who averages 50 grams of protein every day, you're a, a 180 pound male, young male, and you are eating 50 grams of protein every single day. And then you add 40 more grams from a protein shake and now you get 90 you're going to see a significant yeah, You would difference. also notice if you got 40 grams of protein from whole That's foods. right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. my point. So just just keep that in mind. The goal is for us to hit that then uh, that was one of the high the, one of the most important things is protein intake. Make sure you hit that. The goal is to do it through whole foods. If you don't, then it makes sense to to utilize a protein now, powder. Easily, easily my favorite source of protein that is also one of the most inexpensive sources when bought in bulk is ground beef. Are we going to list everything right now? Is Let's that do it, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I think we should that's give a one. grocery list because especially to the point you just made, Justin, that's what I get all the time is, yeah. can you just make it simple? And by the way, when we go through this, I'm sure we're going to miss something that's, well, what about this? Yeah. Or what? This isn't like a, this is the only thing. Yeah. We just, I remember when we were sitting down talking about this episode, we were going, okay, let's put together the most basic, you know, small grocery list yeah. that will pretty much- What's the most the actionable plan that, right. you know, is not going to yeah. be too much. Easy to find, uh, you know, relatively valuable, cheap. relatively inexpensive. And I, I was saying for my, my favorite for protein is ground beef. You can buy bulk ground beef. There's almost always a sale for buying in you know four pounds. And you, you can buy three pounds or four pounds. I mean, you can go to Costco. You mm -hmm. can even go to your local grocery store. They almost always have this value pack of ground beef. And it de depending on if you want to eat more lean, lower calorie, higher calorie, you could go as lean as 95% lean or as, as you know high in fat as 80% uh, you know, lean. And you just buy it in bulk. And then here's what you do. You take what you're going to want for that week out and freeze the rest. It lasts forever. Right. Frozen. You put it in a Ziploc bag, get the air out, throw it in the freezer. Boom. You got all this ground beef that you could defrost and then cook later and on. And I'm just going to throw in ground meat in general there, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, be, uh, ground turkey is probably one of my... And it depends, right? If I was uh, trying to, to build and, and add muscle and gain... 
I lean more towards the the red meat and ground beef because the the higher calorie, higher higher amount of fat that's inside of it, and I need more calories. In the case uh, when I'd go to leaning out, I'd probably lean more towards turkey or chicken things like that. And so I, I just ground meat in general, you know, it, and it can be very very inexpensive. You can get more expensive with other things that I love like veal and bison, and those are all those have tremendous value and stuff. But again, it doesn't it's not it's not on the top of the list. You could easily do ground beef and turkey all day and be fine. Yeah. Plus, I found, you know, one of the sort of benefits to that, too, is like you can eat, you know, like a pound of ground beef versus like a pound of steak. And it's, you know, a little bit more, a little bit less of a chore, let's just say, like, because uh, oh, yeah. I, I know that could be part of it when you're in a surplus. Like sometimes it just feels like, oh, my God, it's just a chore to eat, consume all this food. And so that's where like some people then to immediately go to a protein shake to kind of solve that. But something like ground beef is much uh, easier to digest. Dude, I I first put this together with food when I was, I want to say 17 or 18. And this is the first time I got my body over 200 pounds. And I, I, as a kid, I hadn't started working yet as a personal trainer. So it must've been before I was 18. And so I didn't have a ton of money. I did work, but I worked, I was a dishwasher at this restaurant. And then later on I was, you know, photocopying files at this, you know, this lending place or whatever. So I didn't make a ton of money. I think, I think back then minimum wage was $6 or 25 cents or something like that. But I went to the grocery store, I bought bulk ground beef, and then here's what I would do. I would take it, I had a gas, my dad had a gas grill in the back. You could do this on a George Foreman grill or a pan in, on your stove. And I would just make patties, I weighed them out, or I even just looked at them to be quite honest with you. And I just grilled up a ton of them. That's mm -hmm. all I did, I just grilled up a whole bunch of them that would last me for the whole week. Put them in the fridge, boom, totally done. And cooking them and getting them prepared took me very little time. And if you spread out the amount of time I spent doing it, the amount of money that it took to cost, and then all the meals that I had, it was, I couldn't think of a cheaper, more effective way to get your protein. Oh, along those lines, I literally just sent a text message to Katrina so I don't forget to remind her this episode is making me think of a dish or things I used to do that I haven't done in a long time. And I mean, I used to get, I had a big old iron skillet and I would just ground beef and mix the rice and slice some onions Done. and pepper. Yep. And there, I mean, and just, and I would do it in bulk and then, and then put that free, either freeze it. If I go so much bulk that I got enough for two or three weeks, freeze half of it, put the rest in the refrigerator. So, so inexpensive, so easy, high protein, good source of carbohydrate, easy to store. Like that was a go-to meal for me for it's a long funny, time. It's funny. I swear to God, you do this, you're going to say, it's so funny. I bet you if there's kids listening to us right now or people who are on a budget, if they follow this advice at the end of the month, they're going to be like, I saved 50 bucks or I yeah. saved a hundred bucks. Right. Here's another one. Uh, tuna fish in a can. Extremely inexpensive source of protein. What's funny is this kind of fell out of favor yeah. for a while because of the worries mercury. of mercury or whatever. Yeah. Uh, super overblown. By the way, you look at some of the healthiest countries in the world. Look at the Japanese culture. They eat tremendously more amounts of fish. Uh, you don't see these you know radical levels of mercury poisoning. Poisoning. Actually, in fact, their levels that they allow or that they say are safe are much higher than ours. Um, and then there are other compounds in fish that kind of offset the mercury. Uh, by the way, but tuna fish in a can, super cheap. Super. You don't even have to cook it. You literally open the can. And you've got your source of protein right there. Oh, I'm sure. Did you? I mean, I used to do open it, squirt some mustard on it, and eat it Done. straight out. That Just was like that. That was a trainer move. Oh, all day, I would bring it with long. me. I'd bring a couple cans yeah. with me to work, and or there was the, my lunch. Or the pouched ones they used. They I saw it all the time, but yeah, I couldn't stomach it. Dude. <laughs> not, dude, not yeah, you're not a, you're not a fish guy for <laughs> no, sure. No, he would do the canned chicken nuggets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> canned chicken nuggets. Yeah, where's that at? Yeah, well, uh, another another really easy one that one of the uh, most complete foods is uh, eggs. Oh, one of the most nutrient dense, best muscle building foods that exists yep. on the planet. Whole eggs, by the way, don't take the yolk out unless calories are a big deal for you, but you got your protein. You've got great uh, amounts of branching amino acids. You have uh, choline in the yolk, which is great for brain function, great for immune system function. Um, you have the dietary cholesterol, which is perfectly fine. It's not unhealthy. They, they've all since changed their stance on that, but also has muscle building effects. I consume on average uh, six to 10 whole eggs a day, and it, it, I notice a huge difference. And they're inexpensive. You could buy in, in bulk. And here's a hack for you that I, I mean, I love your, all the foods we're listing, and we, we both just gave some, some ways that we would cook our, our meat and rice type of dishes. 
uh, eggs as a base in the morning with also your dinner or lunch mixed in there is amazing. Yeah. This became so when eggs I, makes everything breakfast. That's right. right. It does. And it's and this was one of the together. way it totally does, right? This I mean, I just talked about ground beef and rice. That same exact leftover dish or one of the, you know, fifteen pre-made meals that I have in the refrigerator, first thing in the morning, I would crack three to four eggs and then take a serving of that meat and rice and throw it in with my eggs yep. and, and make it like a scramble. And now I've got this amazing high high calorie, high protein, good source of, of, of food first thing in the morning for me and super fast and easy. So Totally. Uh, here's another one. I can't do this because I can't have dairy, but when I was younger... In my teens, I could tolerate dairy, and this was a staple for me because, and I remember, I had no idea about cottage cheese, right? By the way, in the 80s and 90s, this was a bodybuilding staple, and for some reason, nobody talks about it anymore. But I remember going to the grocery store as a teenager and being like, oh, what can I get that's easy, that's cheap, that's got good protein? And I remember reading an article about cottage cheese, and I'm like, let me go look at this. And then I got the container, which, and it was cheap. It's so inexpensive. You, I pulled it out. I looked at the back and the macros, and I'm like, it, this literally somebody invented the perfect bodybuilding food in terms of macros. Yeah. Cottage cheese. By the way, you could get it so that it's low in calorie and just protein, or what I recommend, the healthiest way to eat it is whole. Whole milk, cottage cheese. You've got your fats, which, by the way, the fats – in dairy are are fine for your body, excellent for your body, and then high quality protein. By the way, whey protein comes from dairy. So if you're eating cottage cheese or drinking milk, you're getting a good source of dairy, of whey in that uh, particular protein. I well. my favorite was the the whole the whole milk one with. Um uh, with the pineapple slices, yes, because cottage cheese has got a weird. So I didn't, and I never had cottage cheese growing up, and I don't. I wish I remember where I read where I read it, or I'm sure it was in some muscle building. It was magazine. such. It was like a bodybuilding staple. Yeah, probably. well, it became one for me. I but up until that point, up until 20 years old, I had never even tasted it before. It wasn't something that my parents kept in our house, and so it wasn't something I had or ever thought to have. It looked it looked like moldy cheese to me, as yeah. a, you know, what I'm saying. So it's not something I was going after until I read some article that talked about what a great uh, source of protein it was and then I went out trying it and it's so convenient it's so easy if you throw slices of fruit in there if so if the because the texture if you're a texture person or you know if it has to taste good for you like it's got a, it's got a different taste and the texture to it is different it's almost like yogurt ish a little bit like plain yogurt <laughs> yeah, chunky a bit. Yeah. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah chunky moldy yogurt yeah, is what, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I like it I enjoy uh, oh I mean I learned to love it it became a staple but it was different when I first when I first had it and that's why I like the pine, the, the 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 sweet flavor from the pineapple kind of offset the the weird texture. Totally. Taste. Well, back to the whole milk too. Like it's something that was was interesting. Remember that big campaign with milk, or even with like even chocolate milk, about you know basically having all the same amounts of benefits as like doing a protein shake. Totally. The studies show that. 100%. Right. So it's, if you consider that, and you can handle milk in general, especially whole milk. Um, you know, that's something that you can, you know, add for very, very much cheaper than you would going out and buying, you know, an expensive this, uh, jug of this protein. That's what I used to tell my young clients. Like, whoa, Sal, uh, what about protein shake post-workout? I read it does this. Nice. Drink a glass of milk. Whoa, what about pro? I'm like, that's literally a protein shake. Just drink exactly. a glass of milk and you've got everything uh, that you need. You've got a little bit of carbohydrate, especially if it's chocolate milk. But even if it's not, regular milk's got some carbohydrates in there. You've got your proteins that are high quality, easy to, 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 to down. It's inexpensive. There you go. Now, the next one is one of my favorite sources of protein as well. And it's a little bit more like I'm going to kind of splurge a little bit in terms of enjoying my meal. Chicken thighs. You know what's funny too, by the way? I, as a, as a kid growing up in the in the 90s working out it was all about chicken breast chicken mm -hmm. breast chicken breast mm -hmm. you got to eat chicken breast cuz it's lean right and i never even thought about chicken thighs later on i ate chicken thighs i'm like what the hell was i eating before chicken thighs for real guys yeah the the, the breasts are dry boring thighs yeah they definitely have some more fat in them but it's not like they're super fatty you get the skinless thighs they're inexpensive they're very cheap especially if you buy in bulk they taste way better. They're incredible. To this day, it's one of my favorite right Do you know that light bulb did not go off for me till I was 30? Till I was started really? till I started competing. This is why. Because the exact same reason there was this myth or idea that chicken breasts were so superior to any other source of chicken. And so I always ate chicken breasts. As dry as they were, I would stomach them, put them down. And then for the first time in my life, I was like, you know, diligently weighing, measuring, tracking my macros like I never have in my life when I decided to get into competing. And when I started looking at the 
calories and the proteins and the fats that were in the thighs, it was like, it wasn't that far off. And normally for me, I needed more calories. So the extra fat in there would help me out. When you eat chicken thighs the second day, all the, the juicy fat gets all kind of hardened around it. So when you reheat it back up, it tastes delicious. Tastes it's delicious. Yeah. And has, it's not dried out. So when I saw the difference in it, and then, and by the way, too, it's actually cheaper to buy in bulk. Yep. So you can, it was cheaper for me to buy my, buy more, tastes better same day and next day. And when you look at the macro profile, when you, when you add it in the entire day, you're not, it's not that far off. I was like, I, to this day now, I never eat chicken breast. You no. will never see me eat chicken breast today. Day because I just think it's it, why when chicken thighs taste way better and you're talking about a few more grams of fat per ounce that's going on there not even a big of a, that big of a deal in the whole grand scheme of things and it's a good source of fat totally mm -hmm. now speaking of fat unless you're keto you don't need to necessarily typically search out sources of fat if you just eat ground beef and chicken thighs and have whole milk you're going to get plenty of fat yeah, now if you're keto with fat. If you're keto, you may need to go out and seek out fat to hit those calories. But here's some excellent uh, sources of fat. Uh, butter. Butter's great. Butter goes on everything, by the way. Throw some butter on your ground beef. Throw some butter on your rice. Throw some butter on your vegetables. Boom, you've got your extra fats right there. And uh, contrary to common popular belief, uh, butter is not unhealthy for you. If you're otherwise healthy, those fats are perfectly fine. It's a minimally processed source of fats and butter is quite uh, inexpensive. Here's another one. This one, of course, is near and dear to my heart. Olive oil. I love olive oil. Again, you can throw this on anything. If I need extra calories, if I'm like, oh, I'm 200 calories short of my fats, I guess I'll put two tablespoons of olive oil in my ground beef and rice dish. And mm -hmm. guess what? It tastes even better. Mm -hmm. And olive oil, very healthy. Also, when you buy a big jug of it, doesn't cost very much. One of my favorite sources of fat. Well, you were the one that really <laughs> changed this for me because uh, here's another weird thing that, you know, I don't know where it started, like the chicken breast thing, but it was something that I bought into was this idea that I had to eat my vegetables steamed and plain. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. I, I don't know why. You know, I used to think that, like, oh, my God, adding That's why some- we used to hate them so much I, growing I, up. Yes, me too. They were so terrible. Or the other extreme, which my mom would do when her kids is, you know, dr drown, uh, you know, Velveeta cheese all over. <laughs> oh, all yeah. over. Wow. Which Same. that, so as the fitness guy, when I got in, I was like, okay, well, I obviously am not going to do that. So that defeats the purpose of it. But I'm not- I never thought to just adding a little bit of butter or oil and what a difference that makes to taking down the vegetables. I mean, it turns something, that, a dish oh, that I absolutely- charred with oh, some olive oil on top. I amazing. dreaded eating vegetables growing up and even in my early 20s, because that's when I was, but I was, I'd force it down. I'd steam broccoli. I'd steam, I'd steam everything and have nothing on it and eat it dry. And it was maybe a little bit of salt is all I got. And I was like, God, this is so hard. And the minute I started, and I remember seeing you one time come in and you're like- Big ass. Bowl yeah, your rapini was like droused in, doused in butter and oil. I was like, oh my God, bro. He's like, yeah, that's just a couple tablespoons of olive oil and taste 10 times better. I started doing that and it's like, and now I actually love and enjoy eating vegetables. So totally. Great hack. Now here's another couple that I'll caution people because they're, they are quite palatable and it's quite easy to go over on calories. If you're trying to bulk, not a problem. If you're trying to cut, be very careful. Peanut butter and nuts in general or almonds, you can find quite inexpensive, but especially peanut butter. Mm -hmm. Peanut butter, great source of fat. This is where I caution people oh, if you're trying to cut. Butter. It's very easy when you're in a deficit to have a jar of peanut butter, say, I'm going to eat a tablespoon of this, and then you're in a frenzy <laughs> and you want to eat <laughs> yeah. way more than just a tablespoon. If you use peanut butter in your protein shakes or you eat peanut butter on celery or you use peanut butter in anything, because peanut butter is one of my, as I think every bodybuilder can relate to this, like peanut butter is like is like a huge treat, right? Um, you got it at least a couple times uh tablespoon it out with actually a measuring tablespoon not like oh that's a tablespoon spoon just because you use a it tablespoon yeah quick, just because you use a tablespoon yeah. and it's got you know mount everest of peanut butter on top of it it is not what a true tablespoon that's is. what i used to do oh, oh everybody yeah. did i was guilty of the same thing too and then I, again i remember when i started competing and it became so important that i measured all the stuff what I was calling one tablespoon was more like four tablespoons. Right. So you got to do that at least one time to check that because like you said, um, although peanut butter and almonds, totally fine for you to have, real quick the calories will oh, sneak Oh yeah, up. and to a lot of clients that I had, I mean there was a, multiple clients that we found uh, this was a major contributor to you know bumping their calories you know, up 
passed into a surplus, didn't even realize it. And then once we just adjusted that, it was like all of a sudden these results came like almost immediately. Oh, dude, I had a client, same thing. And she's like, I put, you know, a little bit of peanut butter on a rice cake in the morning. And I'm like, would you mind bringing it in and showing me what it looks like? A little. Like, yeah. And I'm like, you do yeah. realize this is three tablespoons. Yeah. It is. I'm like, yeah, let's measure out a tablespoon just to look and see, you know, what that looks like. So what yeah. we just addressed right now, we just listed off a little grocery list that is the essential things, right? So right. this is all, this is your proteins and fats. These are essential. Here's yeah. a great list. You could literally live by this uh, to get you to where you want to be as far as uh, body composition. Uh, now let's talk about some what are our go-to carbohydrates. So even though we didn't list that as essential, but as something that is valuable. And, and it can be optimal, right? right. Just because it's not essential doesn't mean it's not optimal. I think carbohydrates for a lot of people are opt optimizes their performance, their muscle building and mm -hmm. how they feel. The best source, first of all, this is one of the best sources of carbohydrates, period, because of its ease of digestibility. It's one of the easiest to digest foods. It's one of the most widely consumed foods in the world, which also makes it one of the most inexpensive foods you could buy, rice. You could buy a bag of rice, a big old bag of rice for nothing, and then you can cook yourself a pot of rice that'll last you the entire week, and it's a wonderful source of pure starchy carbohydrates. And it goes with everything. Yeah. everything. 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 And I don't know a lot of people that have intolerances towards it as That's well. That's what I'm saying. Which is, Isn't yeah. it more common to have a, an intolerance to brown rice than white rice? That's why I said white yeah. rice. Yes. Yeah. White rice is easier to digest. Believe it or not, brown rice, Long time for a long time, people were told it's healthier because oh, there's more fiber. Mm -hmm. There are anti-nutrients in brown rice. Believe it or not, if you when, they, when you look at third world countries, they consume white rice because when you see them consume lots of brown rice, they start to become deficient in certain nutrients. It's harder to digest because they haven't removed the the hole that is hard to digest. White rice, perfectly fine. Easy to digest. Very inexpensive. It's a staple in my diet, even if I'm spending a lot of money on food. If white you rice, flip the bags around, the macro profile is almost identical. It's like one more gram of fiber and it's like, I, I think literally three three less calories per serving or yep. whatever. It's like negligible as far as the difference between white and uh, brown rice as far as the macro profile of what you're looking for for building. Totally. Rice. Now here's another one. Very inexpensive, wonderful source of starchy carbohydrates, natural source, potatoes. Mm -hmm. You could buy a bag of potatoes for almost nothing. Super cheap. It's one of the most inexpensive foods on the planet. And they're very easy to prepare. I mean, here's what I used to do is I would take a, literally a, a raw potato to work. And then when it was time to eat it, I'd wash it and I'd wrap it in a wet paper towel, put it in the microwave, three or four minutes, flip it, three or four minutes, boom, baked potato, very easily cut it open, take the skin off. And then I had a nice source of you know 50 grams uh, of carbohydrates from, again, a healthy, relatively easy to digest source of protein. Maybe not as easy as white rice, but still quite easy, gluten-free and all that. I know when we when we kind of put the list together, we weren't planning this, but so far, I don't think we've said anything that doesn't mix all well together in a pot. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Like, like really, yeah, like that's what it- just put it all- Yeah, one, one of the things that you'll notice about- yeah, olive, oil, olive oil, ground beef, rice, yeah, or yeah. potato. Like, pff, there you go. Like seriously, I mean, they it, it makes for a really good, you know, oh, I just add some eggs if I want to make it breakfast in the morning, mm -hmm. take the eggs out if I want to call it lunch or dinner. I mean, th this is- And tr that was the idea of putting this uh, episode together was to make it- as, as simple, as practical, practical, and as affordable as we possibly can. Yeah. By the way, so here's some easy ways to improve the palatability of all these foods. Seasoning. Seasoning is inexpensive. Makes a big difference when it comes to meat. Uh, olive oil, we talked about that. Butter, uh, we talked about that. But seasoning is a, is a very big one. Here's another one. Salsa. You could buy very inexpensive salsa almost no calories in it. And let's say I'm eating a lean bowl of ground beef and rice and maybe some a side of vegetables, and I don't have a lot of calories, but I want to add something to it to make it a little bit more palatable. Throw a little bit of salsa on it. Super inexpensive and sriracha. Yeah, and to that, to that point too, once you really start seeking out all this whole foods, uh, you know, in your diet too, to be able to season and add salt to make sure sodium is still a part of that because it oh. does contribute to performance. Uh, you know that you're, you're, you're going for those gains in the gym. Like that's another vital component. Actually, it's a great point. If you sweat a lot, work out a lot, and you're eating all these foods, none of these foods have a lot of sodium in them. You have to add sodium, in fact. Yeah. 
In fact, you may eat too little sodium if you don't concentrate on adding sodium to your diet. Most of the sodium in our diet comes from heavily processed foods. Very, very good point. This is why I benefited so much from uh, LMNT mm -hmm. because I, I don't eat lots of whole, uh, excuse me, lots of processed foods. And without realizing it, my sodium wasn't really meeting, meeting my, my, my performance standards. So here's another one that's, that's really inexpensive. You can buy in bulk. And this was a staple back in the day. It was oatmeal. Oatmeal, you buy a big old thing of oatmeal and have it in the morning, take it with you to work, take it with you post-workout, microwave it with some water or if you want with some milk and boom, you got yourself a bowl of uh, you know, nice diet, you know, starchy carbohydrates. Or this is how I broke up uh, the monotony of always eating uh, the egg scramble. So if I wasn't eating egg scramble, I would end up doing something like oatmeal for breakfast instead. So it's a nice way to break up yeah. or change up your breakfast choices. And I know that fruit's a little further down the list, but that's obviously a great combo. If something like you want to really get a lot, the majority of your carbohydrates, like in the morning, let's say like, you know, a combo obviously of like, a, you know, fruit with oatmeal is amazing. Oh, bananas so, and apples, inexpensive, the, great yeah. sources the of one I will have on oatmeal is it's obviously it's it's I mean you can eat it whenever you want but it's used as a breakfast food most mm -hmm. of the time and it's not high in protein so the my staple oatmeal this is the time this is another time where I would use whey I used to love to put a, oh, a scoop do. of yeah. vanilla whey and so my exact oatmeal like recipe every morning would be it when I have it right is the uh, whey vanilla protein powder inside oatmeal um, I would slice up strawberries and um and blueberries and then uh, uh walnuts and that was like uh, my go-to oatmeal in the morning add a little peanut butter and you have yourself a, or that. a bulking meal if i went the, then peanut butter would be like just the vanilla and peanut butter right so because that's all you need for that you don't want to add fruit with peanut butter that's mm. not very good i did oh, really? <laughs> yeah i did it was really good <laughs> banana maybe. Yeah. yeah yeah banana I that would, would work yeah. oh that's true but yeah banana peanut butter and yeah. that would be good. all right so now let's talk about vegetables right oh what about vegetables and okay Frozen vegetables are so valuable. By the way, there's a myth that fresh vegetables are more nutritious for you than frozen. The truth is, and this is actually quite remarkable, oftentimes frozen vegetables are higher in nutrients than fresh vegetables. Is that true? Yes. Now, people that. are like, well, why? Why is, that, why is that the case? Well, here's why. When they freeze vegetables, they tend to freeze them the flash, at peak. Right, 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 yeah. right when it's ripe. Right. When they're delicious, especially if you don't live in a state like California, right, where we have year-round fresh vegetables growing all around us. But if you live in a state like Nebraska, you, and you, I've, by the way, I've done this. I've traveled to other states and seen their vegetables in the winter, and I'm like, oh my God, these are terrible. Why? They're shipping them from Mexico or flying them from across the country or driving them from across the country. And what they do is they can't pick them when they're ripe mm. and then ship them over. They'll go bad. So they have to allow them to ripen somewhat in the store, which actually makes them less, in terms of nutrients, less nutritious. Frozen vegetables not the case they're frozen at peak nutritional value so you can buy like frozen spinach frozen broccoli frozen brussels sprouts and they're perfectly fine perfectly healthy they last forever one of the problems with buying vegetables that i, I know a lot of people run into is they'll buy a bunch of them and then they end up throwing away half of them because they go bad that doesn't happen with frozen that's broccoli. what i would say yeah, is yeah. That when i when i think about the the probably the the higher percentage of people that are listening to this episode or this episode will appeal to it's i think of the younger younger person going through college on a budget cooking for themselves probably or maybe just them and a boyfriend or a girlfriend so if you're that person frozen makes a, a lot of sense i mean that's one of the hardest things even with just katrina me and max is you know you get fresh we get fresh vegetables all the time and a lot of times we don't cook all of it in time and it ends up going bad and you end up wasting so much of it so getting frozen i think makes a lot of sense just still to this day i eat a lot of frozen uh, vegetables it's super easy but i, I want to make it clear though too that like, because I, what i don't want to do is change this conversation into another stupid debate because tends what happens on like youtube somebody will take sure. one thing that you say and you guys are trying to say that frozen vegetables are better than, yeah. than, than no organic yeah. uh, you know organic uh, farmer's market no i'm not saying that whatatsoever we're talking about for keeping it simple yeah. and easy ease and of access affordable for somebody prep time yes all that yes. stuff that's and, the priority here yeah. with this particular so there you have it there's all your stuff uh, that you can do and i promise if you follow what we're saying you buy these things in bulk you'll probably end up uh, saving money. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com. We have so much free content that we've put together for you guys on all kinds of topics that revolve around working out, nutrition, and health. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So you can find Justin at mindpumpjustin, me at mindpumpsal, and Adam at mindpumpadam.
If food rules you in mm -hmm. many different ways, breaking that chain can make you feel empowered. Now, here's the dark side of that, right? What drives a lot of people to do this is the sense of control. In fact, they'll do it worse when the life around them is very stressful and things seem to be falling apart. That's when they're most strict with that type of eating because 